Romans 14 1-23, through the Bible. Chapter 14, 1 of 3. Theme, Conviction, Conscience. This chapter, brings us to a new section, the final division in the Epistle to the Romans. It is, the separation of the sons of God. What do we mean, by separation? Frankly, I am tired of separated and dedicated Christians, who are not separated or really dedicated. There are two areas of Christian conduct. In one area, the Bible is very clear, as we saw in the preceding chapter. The duty of the Christian to the state, is submission. He is to obey the laws of the land, he is to pay his taxes, and he is to show respect to those in authority. Also, chapter 13 was specific, on a believer's relationship to his neighbor, he is to pay his bills, he is not to commit adultery, kill, steal, bear false witness, or covet what another has. In fact, he is to love his neighbor as himself. The believer is to be honest, and he is to avoid reveling in drunkenness, strife, and jealousy. The Bible is very clear on these things. However, there is another area of Christian conduct, on which the Bible has no clear word. Let me mention only two things, the use of tobacco and mixed bathing, that is, both sexes swimming together. If you don't think these are questionable, let me give you an illustration, out of my own experience. My wife was reared in Texas, in a Southern Baptist church. She was brought up by a mother and father and pastor, who believed that mixed bathing was sinful. Then when she came to California, you can't imagine the shock she had. The first time she went down to the beach, with the young people from our church, even in those days, they weren't wearing much. My wife was in a state of shock, for 24 hours after that. She had never seen anything like it. However, in the area from which she came, the use of tobacco was not frowned upon. The officers of her church smoked, in fact, her pastor smoked. When she came to California, she found that using tobacco was taboo. If you were a Christian, you did not smoke. Is mixed bathing all right in one place, and wrong in another place? Is smoking right in one place, and wrong in another place? I am sure, that the hair on the back of the necks, of some of the saints, is standing on end, and they are thinking, Dr. McGee, you ought to give a lecture against smoking, and you let this subject of mixed bathing alone. Let me assure you, that I am not condemning either one, nor am I condoning either one. I'm not going to stick out my neck on questionable things, any farther than Paul stuck out his neck. In this section, Paul puts down principles of conduct for Christians, relative to questionable matters. He gives us three guidelines, conviction, conscience, and consideration. A Christian should have a conviction, about what he does. Conviction means, that which anticipates. Does he look forward, to what he is going to do, in high anticipation and enthusiasm? The second guideline is conscience. Does he look back on what he has done, wondering if he were right or wrong? Or, does he even hate himself for what he has done? The third guideline is consideration for others. Are other people adversely affected by what he does? These three guidelines give us principles of conduct for our Christian lives. In our day, there are actually two extreme viewpoints, about this matter of Christian conduct in questionable matters. And, it has created an artificial atmosphere, in which one is to live the Christian life. As a result, we have abnormal or subnormal Christians, in these extreme areas. One extreme position, has no wall of separation from the world. The lives of these folk, are carbon copies of the unsaved man of the world. Their lives are no different, from what they were, before their so-called conversion. They indulge in all forms of worldly amusement. They go everywhere the world goes, and they spend their time and energy, in activities that have no spiritual profit. There are certain passages of Scripture, that have no meaning for them at all. For example, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things, Philippians 3 17-19. There are other folk, who do not indulge in any form of worldly amusements, yet, they are as worldly as they can possibly be. They gorge and gormandize themselves. They don't get drunk, but they certainly overeat. Also, 
They over talk, they are great gossips, they even tell questionable stories. Again, let me quote Paul, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things, Philippians 4 8. My friend, your thought life is bound to affect your conduct sooner or later. What you keep thinking about, you will eventually do. I have found, that a great many Christians think about a temptation for a long time, before they actually submit to it. This sort of thing is done, by a great many so-called Christians. Paul seemed to question, whether or not they were Christians, because, they lived exactly as the worldling lived. Now, there is a second group, that is extreme in the opposite direction. They have reduced the Christian life, to a series of negatives. Paul warned the Colossian believers against the group, that was characterized by touch not, taste not, handle not, Colossians 2:21. These folk, rejoice in salvation by grace, and deliverance from the Mosaic law, but, they immediately make a new set of Ten Commandments, only they usually double that number. They become very self-centered, very critical, and very proud. These are the ones that Paul labels, weak in the faith, verse 1, by the way, and, they are the folk, who have become very separated. The following letter, which I received several years ago, illustrates the sad state of one, who adopts this position. I've returned to California after a year of full-time Christian service in Ohio, and an extended trip east. But, I've come back almost spiritually shipwrecked. Have been a Christian for three and one-half years, and until recently, was able to give a glowing testimony about being saved out of unity. But lately, I've been so dead, that Christ seems way up there, and I'm way down here. I have all the negative virtues of a Christian, don't smoke, drink, play cards, attend movies, use makeup, but, those things do not make a happy Christian. My friends tell me I'm becoming bitter, and oh, I don't want that to happen. Before becoming a Christian, I was very ambitious, worked hard for whatever I believed in, and incidentally, I was listed in who's who but now I wonder, what's the use? The world is going from bad to worse, everything is heading for disaster, and the only hope, is to wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my friend, this person was in a terrible condition. Notice, how separated she was, but this kind of separation, will not bring joy in the life. Somewhere between these two extreme viewpoints, of questionable matters in Christian conduct, the believer is to walk. These are the Scylla and Charybdis, through which the believer must sail his little bark on the sea of life. I have given a great deal of space, to these preliminary remarks, because I know, there are many puzzled Christians, who will be helped by what Paul has for us, in this important chapter. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations, Romans 14 1. To put it another way, now, the one who is weak in faith, receive him into your fellowship, but, not with the view of passing judgment upon his scruples, that is, upon his conduct and upon his viewpoint. Now connects this chapter, to what has preceded it. The law of love will now go into action. Having condemned things, in the last part of Romans 13, which are immoral and obviously wrong, like killing, committing adultery, stealing, bearing false witness, and coveting, Paul now warns against the danger, of condemning questionable matters, which are not expressly forbidden in Scripture. The one who is weak in the faith, does not mean, one who is weak in the great truths of the Gospel, the facts of faith, but rather, it refers to the abstract quality of faith. It means, the faith of the weak falters and hesitates, about matters of conduct. He does not know what he should do, relative to certain things. This one, is to be received into the fellowship of believers, with open arms. You may not agree with him, but, you are to receive him, if he is a believer in Jesus Christ. You are not to receive him, in order to start an argument about questionable things. One group of believers is not to sit in judgment upon another group of believers, about questionable matters of Christian conduct. Some things are not expressly condemned in Scripture, but, some believers separate themselves from these things. And, if they want to do this, that's their business. 
These things are not to separate believers. The Schofield Reference Bible, has a very helpful note on this verse. The Church has no authority, to decide questions of personal liberty, in things not expressly forbidden in Scripture. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another, who is weak, eateth herbs, Romans 14 2. This verse may hurt the extreme separationist. The strong brother in the faith, is the one eating all things, the weak brother is the vegetarian. The strong brother realizes, that Jesus made all meats clean, cleansing all meats, Mark 7 19. After the flood, God gave all meats to be eaten, according to Genesis 9 3, every moving thing that liveth, shall be meat for you, even as the green herb, have I given you all things. God made a distinction, between clean and unclean animals for the nation Israel. The instructed believer knows, this does not apply to him, for the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 8 8, But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither, if we eat, are we the better, neither, if we eat not, are we the worse. You remember, that Peter was given a practical lesson about this subject, on the housetop of Simon the Tanner in Joppa, Acts 10 9-16. Peter was proud of the fact, that he had not eaten anything unclean. Boy, was he separated, and he was proud of it. The Holy Spirit said to him, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common, Acts 10 15. Paul could eat meat without his conscience bothering him, but Peter had scruples about it. The weak believer who has a background of eating vegetables, finds eating meat repugnant to him. What is the principle? One can eat meat, and the other cannot eat meat. By the grace of God, one is not to eat meat, and the other is to eat meat. Now, listen to Paul. Let not him that eateth, despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not, judge him that eateth, for God hath received him, Romans 14 3. I recognize that I am wrong, when I condemn these extreme separationists. If they want to be that way, candidly, that is their business. The thing that upsets me, is that they want to straighten me out. I know I need straightening out, but they are not the crowd to do it, I'm sure of that. One group is not to condemn the other. If you believe that you should not eat meat, he uses meat as an example, but this could apply to anything else not expressly forbidden in Scripture, then you should not eat meat, my friend. But, if you believe that you can eat meat, then you go ahead and eat meat. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand, Romans 14 4. This is devastating. Paul asks, what right have you to judge another man's servant? What right have you, Christian friend, to sit in judgment on another Christian's conduct, when it involves something that is questionable? Are you God? Is that person accountable to you? Paul says, he is not accountable to you. He is accountable to God. He is going to stand before his own master. Can you imagine, being a dinner guest in someone's home, and the servant brings in cold biscuits? You say to the servant, what's the big idea of bringing me cold biscuits? And you chide, in our common colloquialism, ball out, the servant. May I say to you, there would be an awkward silence in that home. That person is not your servant. Maybe she should not have served cold biscuits, but it is not your place to say so. I have a notion, that the lady of the house will go back to the kitchen, and will tend to the matter. Now, maybe you disapprove of my conduct in one of these doubtful areas. I don't have to account to you, you are not my master. I am responsible to Jesus Christ. He is my master.